So I've titled uh, this morning's message, Life After Death. But I want to begin with this. American writer William Sorian telephoned into the Associated Press this final, very Sorian-like observation. Everybody's, everybody has got to die, but I have always believed an exception would be made in my case. Now what? It appears that Mr. Sorian lived his life ignoring one of the most important questions in life. What happens after I die? And maybe this is one of those questions that you have thought of maybe throughout your entire life or maybe just recently or um, maybe you already know the answer. Maybe you're comfortable with it, you're at peace with it. Maybe some of you watching or listening or here today maybe aren't sure. You've heard so many things out there, so many beliefs, so many ideas about what happens to a person when they die. But here today, we're going to be talking about that. And so, again, Mr. Sorian, he lived his life ignoring this really important questions, this really important question. And it wasn't until the end of his life, of that life, that he realized that he didn't have a single clue. He had no idea. And it's this question that sooner or later, everyone will find themselves asking. And how one answers that question will determine how they live and how they die. It will determine whether you live this life with joy and hope, or live this life with a fear of death because it just might happen tomorrow. Now, I read this interesting article from a research group. Um, and there it said, despite the constant flux in many dimensions of American lives, a new study from the Barna Research Group of Ventura, California, shows that most people have retained surprisingly traditional views about life after death. Although the lifestyles, values, and self-perceptions of most adults have undergone significant change, and millions of Americans have embraced many elements of a postmodern worldview, the vast majority continues to believe that there is life after death, that everyone has a soul, and that heaven and hell exist. However, more than 50 million adults are uncertain regarding their personal eternal fate. Let me give you an example. For the 20th, 20th century of Larry King Live, Barbara Walters interviewed the man who became famous interviewing others. She asked him direct and revealing questions. Two of the most telling responses came when she probed about the fear, about fear and death and faith. Walters asked King, what's your greatest fear? He immediately replied, death. This interview occurred in 2005 when he was at the very top of his career and had much to lose. But none of that mattered compared to the fear of death. Her follow-up question was, do you believe in God? King stated, not sure. I'm agnostic. And I'll get more in depth about some of these beliefs in just a minute, but back in our, to our study, belief in the life and death, like the existence of God, is widely embraced. Eight out of ten Americans, that's 81%, believe in an afterlife of some sort. Another 9% said life after death, death may exist, but they weren't certain. Just one out of 10 adults, 10%, contend there is no form of life after one dies on earth. <clears throat> Moreover, a large majority of Americans, 79%, agreed with the statement, every person has a soul that will live forever, either in God's presence or absence. 
So what about evangelicals? What about Christians? Well, evangelicals, born-again Christians, and elders, people, this is people uh, ages 58 and older, were most likely, uh, most, most likely segments to embrace the idea of life after death. Those least likely to believe in life after death were Hispanics, busters, those ages 20 to 38, re- residents of the West, atheists and agnostics, those associated with a faith other than Christianity, and unchurched adults. Although more than one third, more than one thirds of each of these groups accept, accept the existence of an afterlife. Now, yes, it's true. There are different beliefs. There are different religions out there who have different views about what happens after one dies. And let me just share. I saw a bunch of them, but I'll just share just a few of them. Have you guys ever heard of Epicureanism? Well, according to Epicureanism, there is no afterlife. So nothing like reincarnation, heaven, or hell exists to them. When an individual dies, the believers here believe that the soul also dissolves and that becomes the end of them. Physicist Stephen Hawkins, Hawking sorry, had a somewhat similar view. He said this, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I hear some other interesting beliefs. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce this. I think it's Duce, Duce, not sure, but those adherents, Duce adherents worship Kim Il-sung. North Korea's first dictator, who also rules as the eternal president, Kim Il-sung's son, Kim Jong-il, who ruled as his father's surrogate, and Kim jong Soko, the wife of Kim Il-sung. Jusha has fashioned after Christianity with those people representing that our religion's trinity, positions held by God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in Christianity. Jewish followers believe that if, when they die, they will be with their dictator president forever. This is something I didn't know. This was new to me when I found out this was actual belief in North Korea, since all religions are outlawed there. The Aztecs. The Aztecs of, of old believe that when one of their own died, they would enter into one of the three places they believed was where they would spend the afterlife, Miklan, Dioclan, or the sun. Women who lost their lives during childbirth and fallen warriors were believed to transform into hummingbirds. Those who drowned were believed to go to Dioclan, and those who died from horrible causes ended up in Miklan. According to Buddhists, life is a journey, whereas death is returning to earth. Most of the religions that believe in reincarnation have, have a similar idea of where they believe an individual ends up after this life, despite slight variations concerning how someone gets to the next reincarnation or achieves nirvana. Well, according to Buddhism, a Buddha who has attained a state of enlightenment is the only one who gets to enter nirvana, the highest state of perfect peace and happiness, where one individual suffering, where one's individual suffering and desires do not exist. Those who fail to achieve nirvana are reborn immediately after death, where they receive another body. With so many beliefs, how can then one really know what the truth is? Well, on this Resurrection 
slash Easter Sunday, we're going to be re-examining a familiar passage that shows us the truth about life after death. See, regardless of your success or status, if you're uncertain about God, you will most assuredly be fearful of death. Easter reminds us that the fear of death dissolves when we walk with the one who walked out of the tomb. And you're also going to see that all those religions, all those beliefs, they all fall short. They all fall short. They, there's nothing as good and as perfect and as true as a belief and faith in Jesus Christ. And so let's go to our passage now. Again, this is a very familiar passage, and it's Luke chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found a stone rolled away from the tomb, they went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was uh, still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Sure enough, this week, it was an eventful week that was known as the Passion Week, which began on Palm Sunday. If you were with us last week, we covered Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and I explained what the significance was of Palm Sunday. And so now from that point to the events that we just uh, let, read about, that just happened, this is basically what has happened. Jesus had been betrayed by someone that he loved very much, very much. He was arrested. He was illegally put on trial. He was falsely accused. He was given a death sentence. He was tortured. He was mocked. And then he was nailed to a cross. Way before all this happened, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like sheep silent before the, her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He did that all without saying a single word without confronting any of his accusers, without saying, why are you spitting on me? Why are you pulling my beard? Why are you putting that crown of thorns on my head? Do you know it hurts? Leave me alone. I didn't do nothing. No, he said nothing. Also keep in mind that we're also told in the Gospels that there were also two criminals, two thieves that were nailed to, the cro to a cross alongside of him, one to his right and one to his left. Now, this fact is important because even when one of those criminals was about to die, he knew that death wasn't the end. And he found comfort and security in Jesus. That criminal said this in Luke chapter 23, verse, verse 42. 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is how Jesus responded in the next verse, verse 43. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here was this man who lived his adult life as a criminal, as a thief. He had no hope. Then he looked at Jesus. There was something about him. And he knew that in that man, in Jesus, laid the answers to everything, laid eternal life. So he put his faith and trust in him. And all he said was, remember me. Jesus knew, he understood what that meant. He saw in his heart. And he said, you will be with me in paradise. So again, that is proof there that there is life after death. Well, John 19.30 then tells us that Jesus cried out, it's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After this, he was taken down from the cross and placed in a guarded tomb. Everyone at that point thought it was it. That was it. Everyone thought, okay, my problems are gone. The, the religious leaders thought, hey, you know what? We, don't have, we can just go back to our, the way things were. We go back to the status quo. I don't have to worry about this Jesus guy. And the Roman authorities, they too were like, hey, this is one less problem we have to deal with. This is one less problem that is going to go up, you know, it will reach Caesar. We can, we handle this issue, we handle this problem here and now, and that's it. Our hands are wide clean. But little did they know that his story, Jesus' story, would continue three days later beginning with the passage that we just read. Now, when I was a kid, maybe some of you are the same age. I think most of you, some of you are the same age as me. But when I was a kid, most of the movies I watched typically usually had a happy ending. There was a sense of finality. And you never really knew if there was going to be a part two or three or four or five or six or seven, you just, you know, you just were happy the way it ended. Sadly, too many of us view the resurrection of Jesus similarly, as little more than a nice, happy conclusion to the gospel story. But the Easter story isn't just what happens next to Jesus after his death. It doesn't just wrap up the story. It fulfills it. Not only would there be no story without it, but we ha we'd have nothing and we'd also be nothing. The resurrection, my friends, saves us and proves that life doesn't end after physical death. So you see, church, the crucifixion is kind of like movies that we see nowadays where people stick around till even after the credits are rolling to see that end credit scene. Those end credit scenes, they make you, what they do is they make you anticipate for what's coming next. Easter Sunday, then, is the beginning of Part two. And that part two is still continuing to this day. Paul reveals the necessity of Easter in a striking way. In Romans 4.25, he said, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He connects the resurrection to our justification. 
He's not saying we're half saved by the cross and half saved by the resurrection. But he's saying without the resurrection, we're lost. No resurrection means no justification. It says in 1 Corinthians 5.17, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Jesus is dead, our sin debt remains unpaid and we remain under sin's dominion. If there was no Easter life for Jesus, there is no new life for us. The blood of Jesus saves us because he is now alive. Why exactly do we need the resurrection for these things to be certain? Well, the wider story of the Bible shows us. The raising of Jesus from death is significant because death is significant. It's only when we understand what death means that we'll be able to grasp, really grasp what Easter means. See, church, death is the consequence of sin. Adam was told this as far back as Genesis chapter 2. Eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you will surely die. God is life. So turning from him is fatal. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And James 1.15 says, sin gives birth to death. Thus, death is what sin chooses, what sin receives, and what sin deserves. This accounts for why we have such a strange perception of death. Death is, when we think about it, one of the most normal things about life in this world. And it's as, it's as certain and it's as, as sure as our birth. But here's the thing. We can't reconcile ourselves to this reality. Death never really feels natural. It almost feels wrong. It almost feels like this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Maybe some of you have lost people you really care about, you really love. Lost my mother two years ago. And Robin just recently lost hers. And it was tough. And it, yeah, I, I, I get that feeling. It feels, it doesn't feel right. Like this isn't the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be together forever. We're supposed to be living in fellowship and being a family and something strange, weird about it. Like it's out, out of place. It's not supposed to be there. Our knees with death indicates we know perhaps more than we realize. Death, like sin, doesn't belong here. It's something we weren't meant to experience. But sin leads to death. And so the existence of death, it proves the reality of sin. So as we grasp the significance of death, we can start to see the significance of the resurrection. Raising Jesus from the dead wasn't an arbitrary stunt by God the Father. It wasn't just a mega miracle to prove he's still there and he's still bigger, even though that is absolutely true. No, the resurrection has meaning. The resurrection is the outworking proof of our salvation because death is the outworking proof of our sin. Jesus' new life shows us the cycle of sin and death has finally been broken. 
there is new life to be had. Sin, church, believer, has been conquered. Someone somewhere once said, the tomb can hold them no longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope, triumphant, say, Christ arose that resurrection day. Christ arose this resurrection day. It's therefore the resurrection of Jesus and can only be the resurrection of Jesus that assures us salvation, that will assure you true life after death. Only the resurrection proves that our sins have been fully dealt with, that death is no longer our destination, but a gateway to a perfect, endless life. The cross isn't a starter pack, starter pack. God doesn't drum up most of what we need only to leave us fishing around in our pockets to provide for the rest. By dying and rising for us, the Son has closed the deal in raising him from the dead. The Father has signed for it. Spurgeon said this, Upon a life, I did not live. Upon a death, I did not die. I risk my whole eternity on the resurrection. So do you see? Do you see why the resurrection is so important and why it differs so much in, from some of those religions that I mentioned? In each one of those religions, either there's nothing and it's empty and sad and that's it. There's finality. Or you just have to keep reincarnating. And try and try again. So if anybody asks me, do I believe in the reincarnation? Oh, heck no. Would you want to do this life all over again? No, I wouldn't. It's been hard. As it is, and I've only lived 46 years. Some of you lived a lot more longer, a lot longer. No. When I die, I want to be with the Lord. I want to know for a fact that I'm going to be going to heaven. I want to know for sure I'm going to be with Him and with God, you know, just joy and peace and being around those that I love, care about. I want to be worshiping the Lord with all my heart, with all my voice, on the top of my lungs. I want to glorify Him for everything He had, He's done for me. Those religions, those faiths, it's not enough. It's always falling short. You have to, again, you have to do it over. Many of them, you have to do it over and over again. If you don't, you know, you do it once and you, you still fall short, you got, you know, it's just too much. But Jesus, again, when he died on the cross and when he arose from, he from the grave, he gave us a one-way ticket. All he says is just believe in me, have faith in me, trust in me, confess me. You will have eternal life. That's all it takes. That's all it takes, folks. Is there life after death? Absolutely. Jesus proved it. Jesus showed us what that looks like. You know, and, and we have to remember, too, that one, one other way he proved it was after what happened that evening. There was, you know, the Gospels tell us different accounts of things that happened. But one of the, th one of the accounts that sticks to me was 
And we're told about Thomas. Thomas wasn't sure whether what he was seeing was real. He thought he, thought he was seeing a ghost. But Jesus, what did Jesus tell him? Basically told him, hey, you know what? If you don't believe me, put your finger here on my wounds. He said, put your hand right here, your finger right here where I got, where I got pierced. And that's all it took for Thomas to say, my God and my Lord, or my Lord and my God. I have that mixed up, but he believed. That was Jesus in bodily form, flesh and blood, just like us. It wasn't a spirit. It wasn't a ghost. It, wasn't a, it was his resurrected body. And one day, if you're a believer in Christ, if you're born again, you will have a similar body. The Bible tells us that you will have a resurrected, glorious body. Now, some might argue, some might say, how do we really know that Jesus walked out of that tomb? Well, here are just a few proofs about the resurrection. First of all, Jesus himself testified to his coming resurrection from the dead. In Mark, and Matthew, and Luke. And then, in Luke chapter 24, it says the tomb was, e was empty on Easter. In Acts chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, the disciples were almost immediately transformed from men who were hopeless and fearful after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, into men who were confident and bold witnesses of the resurrection. Paul claimed that not only had he seen the risen Christ, but that 500 others had seen him also, and many were still alive when he made this public claim. The sheer existence of a thriving, empire-conquering early Christian church supports the truth of the resurrection claim. The Apostle Paul's conversion supports the truth of the resurrection. The New Testament witnesses don't bear the stamp of dupes or deceivers. There is a self-authenticating authenticating glory in the gospel of Christ's death and, resurre and resurrection as narrated by the biblical witnesses. Now, if you've never known or understood why the resurrection matters, let me just give you a few reasons why it means so much. The resurrection means that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Romans 1.4 tells us that that Jesus Christ has been declared to be the powerful Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness. Number two, the resurrection means we can be confident we will be resurrected. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul wrote, Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. <clears throat> this is one of those passages, verses that you might have heard being read or spoken during funerals. That you might also want to be read at your funeral. But it's that. That's what it is. Those who have fallen asleep. Those who have fallen asleep... Uh, he will bring them up with him. Those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. Number three, the resurrection means that there's a, a clear distinction between these temporal bodies and eternal resurrected bodies. Speaking of the resurrection of the dead, Paul explains that the differences, that the difference, the difference is like this. Sown in corruption, these bodies, raised in 
raised in incorruption in or resurrected bodies. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is also a spiritual body. I can go on and on, explain, keep ex trying to explain to you why, how the Bible shows us why or that there's life after death. But I know that uh, I'm going to have to leave a lot of that to you to, to read and study. I'm one of those pastors that will just encourage you. I'll, you know, I, if I don't have to give you the answer right away, I will just encourage you to read for yourself. Read what the Bible says. Does the Bible tell us that there's life after death? Yes. But what kind of life? What does that mean? Well, when Jesus died, it meant something glorious, something amazing, something beautiful, something greater and bigger than any religion ever offers and anything this world can give you. This world can only give you temporal pleasures. This world can only satisfy you here and now while you're alive in these physical bodies. But Jesus, you put your faith in Jesus. He gives you so much more. He gives you eternal life. He gives, he pours his spirit inside of you. That is one of the greatest gifts God can offer us. And is there life after death? Absolutely. Do you have life after death? What do you believe? What do you think about this topic? Do you believe like some of these other religions? Do you believe in the truth? Do you believe there's only one way, one truth, and one life? Believe in Jesus. Maybe some of you sitting here or watching and listening online who have never heard or have forgotten about the promises of Jesus. Like the women who went to go visit Jesus in our story here. Tragedy is it. Your hopes have been crushed. The world is crashing down on you. And your only concern is a massive problem that lays ahead. This morning, today, on this Resurrection Sunday, God wants you to come to the tomb to show you something amazing and to give you hope again. He wants you to see the stone that, was stood, that stood in the way between you and Jesus and that had been rolled away to let you in so that you may see the reality of the resurrection. He wants you to see that Jesus isn't dead. That he's alive. And because he lives, you can trust that he will keep his promises. The death of Jesus on the cross was the payment for your sins. But the resurrection was the receipt showing that the payment was perfect in the sight of God the Father. Jesus died and rose for you. And now he's inviting you to meet with him. 
Are you willing to take him up on that offer? Are you ready to go into the tomb and see the reality of the resurrection? To see there is life after death. There is hope. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, even if you're on your deathbed, there is hope. It's never too late. He is giving you an opportunity to come inside that tomb and see that he is risen. And once inside, the choice of what you do, what you believe, what you say is up to you. Either you can say, yeah, I believe he's risen. Or you can be like, no, there's got to be another explanation. Do you know for a fact that after you die, you will have life? Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that before I close here this morning. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And let me just share this with you as you do that. You know, it tells us that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. Our sins are like dirty rags to Jesus. But he sent his son to die for you. To die in your place. An innocent man didn't commit a single sin. He took your place on the cross. The death that you deserved, he took it upon himself. And when he died, the story tells us, the Bible tells us that the veil there in the temple was torn in two. It was ripped in half. And as a result, everyone now who believes in him now has access to the Holy of Holies, to the most holy place. So you can come to him with confidence. You can come to him knowing that he will hear you out. But you gotta trust in him. You gotta believe in him. Are you ready to confess him as your Lord and Savior? If you are, I want to invite you to the cross. So there, lay your sins there and Ask him to forgive you. Well, let me lead you in a prayer to do that. So again, wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe right now. Now I do, with all my heart, I do believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I repent. I turn from my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, Amen. If you prayed that, let us know. Let us know you prayed that and we want to celebrate with you. We want to let you know that you're now a child of God and we want to lead you into your next steps of your faith. If you need a Bible, we can send one to you. And if you need a church to go to, you know, call us and we'll lead you, you know, send you to a, to a good Bible teaching church. But if you're in the area here, we want to invite you to come check us out here on the northeast in the corner of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. Folks, this isn't it. There's more. You know that after he rose from the dead, after spending time with his disciples, and you know, he ascended up to heaven. Jesus, in this bodily form, 
in this new perfected form, ascended up to heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you and for me. He's our advocate. He's up there telling the Lord, yeah, I know he's not perfect and he still messes up. But my blood is covering him. He's white as snow. He's your child now. He's been made perfect. Or she has been made perfect. What a glorious God we have. What a beautiful and amazing Jesus we have. You know what? Now God the Spirit is living in you. He's living in me. He's living in us. He's teaching us and guiding us and directing us. Showing us how wonderful things about the Bible. and Showing us, telling us, you know what, stay away from there. Don't go hang out with that person. Hey, you know what? You really blew it here. You need to ask for forgiveness. We're now God's children, and he is in us. And I mean, it's just wonderful. But I don't want to go off on another tangent there. And um, but just know this new life is wonderful. It's beautiful. It's going to have its challenges, yes. That's why you need brothers and sisters in Christ that will be around you to support you, to pray for you, to encourage you. So let us know how we can help you in that area. Thank you for watching this morning's resurrection service. I hope that you have a great Easter Sunday. Um, be careful wherever you're at. Enjoy all the food that you might be having today. Um, and... Uh, Take some time just to remember what Jesus did for you. Also, if you're watching, listening, share this with anybody. Send this out to anybody that needs to hear this message today. You never know. Their life could be changed forever as a result of this message. So um, please share it. Have a great day. We love you and praise you. We'll see you next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.